Kunjabihari Jai Gopichano Vallava Kirivara Dari Gopichano Vallava Kirivara Dari Tishodhananana Bajajana Ranjana Jishodhananana Bajajana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Jayaradha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jayaradha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Kopi Janabalaba Girivara Dari Kopi Janabalaba Girivara Dari Shudhanana Prajajana Ranjana Shudhanana Prajajana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Jana Balaba Girivara Dhari Gopi Jana Balaba Girivara Dhari Vishwara Nandana Vajajana Ranjana Shishodana Nana Prajajana Ranjana Yasodana Nana Prajajana Ranjana Yasodana Nana Prajajana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari E Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jay Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jay Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai <coughs> Sri Krishna Jan Mastami Ki Jai Hare Or Krishna Ki Jai Dai Go Premanandi Hari Hari Bo You wanna Go on the next yes. Uh, Hare Krishna, uh, devotees. Thank you for joining uh, today for our special Sunday feast lecture. Uh, two days from now, we'll be celebrating Krishna Janmashtami. So we thought, yeah. what would be the better topic than uh, preparing our consciousness for this up and coming festival, most important festival, Sri Krishna Janmashtami. So we have requested uh, Mahatma Prabhu to speak on this topic. Uh, Mahatma Das has been serving ISKCON since 1969. 
He received first and second initiation in 1970 in Los Angeles, California. He has served as temple president and Sankirtan leader in several temples and has been involved in congregational development and college preaching. He was a co-director of the Vihi, Krishna Fest and Bhagavat Life. He now focuses on designing and conducting professionally organized workshops and retreats, both live and online, to assist devotees and non-devotees in their spiritual growth through his company, Sattva. He also counsels devotees and non-devotees, travels half year and writes books. He posts a daily video on Facebook. He accepted the service of initiating spiritual master in 2013. Mahatma Das is well known for his beautiful bhajans and kirtans, both live and recorded, especially for his recording of the Brahma Samhita, and is most appreciated for helping devotees practically apply Krishna consciousness in their lives. He presently resides in both Alachua, Florida, and Mayapur, India, with his wife, Janwa, and their daughter, Shama Mandeli. He does several online courses weekly on Facebook, and these courses are housed on his YouTube channel and SoundCloud. So let's welcome, on behalf of ISKCON Boston, His Grace Mahatma Prabhu, by loudly chanting Haribo. 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 This is the fourth time we have uh, His Grace Mahatma Prabhu. We are indeed very honored and blessed to have you, Mahatma Prabhu, uh, for our Sunday Feast class. Nice to be here. I was, I was only at the Boston Temple once in my life, and that was in 1986. Oh. So I spent most of my time on the West Coast. So it's had, in this will be a historic. Lecture, yeah, then. this is like I never was, you know, I wasn't, my service during Prabhupada's time was on the West Coast. And um, yeah, and then after I spent a little time outside the country, then I came back to the West Coast, and then I came back to Dallas, then I came here, and my wife's from New York. So Boston somehow or other, Massachusetts, I never... I'm not known there so much because I never go there. But anyway, now that I'm here. Yeah. Please yeah. put now Boston on your map, please. It's easy on my Zoom. On my Zoom map, I can put any place. On the oh, actual okay. map, there's a little bit of a problem. Um, Maybe on rare occasions, like. Uh, yeah, I mean, if we're, if, if we're near. Yeah. Yeah. Next year. Maybe, yeah. Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Ti Namane Namaste Sharashati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvise Sasanyavadi Paschatya Dasatarini Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Panchakapa Turubyas Cha Krupa Sindhu Vyeva Cha Patitanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namona Maha Mukam Karoti Vacha Lam Pangu Langayate Girim Yakrapa Tamaham Vande Sri Guru Dinatarinam There's so many things that could be said to help us prepare ourselves for Janmashtami. When I was a young devotee, Janmashtami was not a big celebration. It was more just for the devotees. It's every Janmashtami, I would just chant all day, 64 rounds. I would try. Yeah, usually we would chant, you know, and just hear and chant. That's what we did. We took it as like a Sabbath, a day off, to just become absorbed. And when I was a young devotee, I had, I had some doubts that being absorbed in Krishna, thinking of Krishna, was, was actually service. It was actually something we should be doing, as opposed to just working very hard and doing a lot of service for Krishna. And I thought, maybe thinking of Krishna is not, it's not really, it's not the most important thing. And I wrote Prabhupada and I asked him. And as you all know, Prabhupada was so, was so adamant about spreading Krishna consciousness, opening temples, farms, restaurants, so forth, schools, and making the world Krishna conscious. At the same time, 
When someone became a devotee, he was very concerned that they remain a devotee. So he said, he said the whole purpose of everything we're doing is to be absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. That was, that was kind of at that time when I wrote him, I was twenty years old, and so always thinking of Krishna seemed impossible. And I didn't really think that was the goal of Krishna consciousness. I thought the goal was to spread it. And Prabhupada, of course that goal is there also, but Prabhupada said, absorbed in thoughts of Krishna, of, there's a difference between thinking of Krishna and absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. And then when I reflect on this word, ab word, word absorbed in thoughts of Krishna, it's interesting. Because the nature of the mind is that it gets absorbed in thoughts. And you can think about something deeply. It's natural, that's what the mind does. You're interested in something, you want to read everything about it, discuss it with anyone you can. <clears throat> you get a new product, or you're thinking about a product, you, you get very absorbed in learning about it, then you get the product, you get very absorbed in using it, thinking about it, isn't it? So that's the nature of the mind. Or there's some, some philosophical point you're trying to understand, and discussing with different devotees, going back and forth in your mind. What does it mean? Does it mean this? But Prabhupada said that. But this Maharaj said this. And then it's very easy to get absorbed. <clears throat> so Prabhupada said get absorbed in thinking of Krishna. That's the nature of the mind. So that was, that was always my, my feeling on Janmashtami or Gaur Purnim or any of the holidays, the bigger holidays that... We should be absorbed. That's the day we should be absorbed in Krishna consciousness, nothing else. Now, if you have to work, if you can get off, that's better. If you can happen to get sick on Tuesday morning, all of a sudden, and call in sick. It's just, Janmasmi, it, it shouldn't be a day that's normal, like every other day, that we just do our normal business. It really should be a day to become more absorbed in Krishna consciousness. And in our busy lives, that's not always easy. When we go to the Dham, we go on Parikrama, we're very happy because we're very absorbed in Krishna. Isn't it? So, at least on Janmashtami, that should be our goal. More hearing, more chanting, more reading, more classes, more discussion. And because Krishna's unlimitedly vast. There's so many ways to get absorbed in thinking of him. And, and now, you know, we would naturally think we should be absorbed in thinking of him about his birth. But his birth, thank you. Thank you. But his birth, his activities, his, um, it's all absolute. So everything is, everything is good. Now, if we look at what Krishna does when he comes here, obviously one thing he comes to do is teach. That's done primarily through Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> but he also comes to attract. And why is he coming to attract? And how does he attract? Well, he attracts through his activities. Just like we know, uh, we heard, I think I was actually in India when it happened, when the Ramayan was being shown on television. It's like, you know, in India, stopped. You know, the Leelas of Ram and then Mahabharata, especially Ram, are so attractive. So Krishna comes to attract us through his Leelas. And what Krishna is doing by coming here, you may say, well, he's doing his Leelas for his personal enjoyment. And of course, that's true, but it's not entirely true. He's doing his Leelas as advertisements. And, and the way that I see it, it's, it's very similar to a travel agency. Of course, travel agencies used to be very popular, but with, <clears throat> with social media now, <clears throat> you generally don't need a travel agent. You can do most of it yourself. But in the, I don't know, I mean, I don't travel with a travel agent, but in the days with we would use travel agents. You would go to the travel agency and you'd be thinking of taking a vacation and they would have different pamphlets about different places you could go, <coughs> excuse me, different countries you could go. 
So you'd see pictures. They'll tell you what you can do there. And you learn about it. I'm sure this is all online. You know, you want to go some country. Just watch the videos put out by the Tourist Bureau. And that's exactly what Krishna is doing in his Leela. It's actually an advertisement for Braj. Because Krishna wants us to come and join his pastimes in Braj. So he has to show us that what he does with his friends, with his parents, with the gopis, with his servants, is infinitely greater than what we're doing here and infinitely greater than anything we could get here. He has to show us that because we're so, you know, we're so entangled in this world and we're desperately trying to be happy. So we, we do so many things to make ourselves happy and we, we easily can become illusioned to think, well, everything's fine, I'm happy, you're living in Boston, important city, you have a good job, a nice home, your husband or wife has a good job, you have more money than you need, you have a nice car, your kids are getting well educated. It can seem like, you know, it's, it's okay, it's not so bad, or I'm happy, or things are good, you know. I worked hard, but I made it, and now I'm doing well. And Krishna, is, when he comes, he's, he's coming to send the message. Well, no matter how well you're doing and how well things are going, I want you to come back and I'm going to show you what goes on there. So I'm going to give you a little sample. Like if you go to a movie theater, before the movie starts, they have previews of other movies that they are showing at the theater or they will show next week, week after, right? So they call that preview of coming attractions. So Krishna comes and does his leela, and that's like the preview. It's like, here, you, could, you can be part of this. Here's what I do, here's a sample. Of course, I can't show you everything because my pastimes are unlimited, but you get some idea, this is what I do. Now, compare what I'm doing, compare what my friends are doing, my lovers, my parents, to what you're doing, and then you start to understand, oh, what Krishna's doing is better in every way. And otherwise, you just have, you know, some very vague concept of God uh, and very impersonal concept. And that impersonal concept is not going to pull you to Krishna. It's not going to pull you out of Maya. Krishna's going to pull you out of Maya by his attractiveness. So, we were giving class the other day when someone, one devotee was asking about one of Krishna's pastimes. Why did he do something? I forget what she was saying. It was, it didn't make sense within the Leela or it seemed contrary to the Leela. And I said something that I think is important for this discussion. I said, when Krishna, oh, she said about Kunti, how oh, there's a question about Kunti and Kunti's suffering. I, f I forget. <clears throat> but anyway, it was a question that it, it, it seemed to not make sense in terms of Krishna's relationship with Kunti, that he would put her in certain situations. So I was, I w I was saying, one of the, amongst other things, one of the things I was saying is that when Krishna does his leelas, he knows that we're going to be watching the leelas. And so when he does the leelas, partially he does them knowing that we're watching and so that certain things will happen which are instructive to us through the leela. Certain things will happen which are attractive to us through the leela. So it's not just him doing his leela with his devotees, but obviously he's very conscious all of these leelas are going to be recorded. He knows that, right? All of these leelas are going to be known to whoever reads the Bhagavatam, the Ramayana, the Mahabharat. And all these leelas have messages or they have power in attracting us to Krishna. So he's, he knows what he's doing. He's very aware of that. So when we think of Janmashtami, I think one thing we should think of is 
We left Krishna and Krishna's coming with his big net to fish us up and bring us back. And the way he fishes us up, fishes us up or fishes us back is not only through his instruction, but it's through his pastimes to attract us back. And so I think that's a good place to start in our preparation for John Mastavi. Now there can be there can be a little bit of guilt or a lot of guilt surrounding that I left Krishna. It's a it's a bad feeling if you think about it. It's it doesn't make you feel good. That <clears throat> it doesn't make us feel good that we could have left Krishna. And just thinking about it is it, you know, kind of makes you want to disappear, doesn't it? That I turned my back on Krishna and now I'm in this world. The the most loving person the person I have an eternal relationship with, my eternal friend, I turn my back on him. That's a very difficult thought to bear within our heart, and a difficult emotion. But in spite of that, Krishna is missing us. And proof that he's missing us and proof that he wants us to come back is that he comes here. Now, I know a lot of us feel like well, maybe I don't deserve to go back, or I I wouldn't. I wouldn't understand. I wouldn't understand why Krishna would care because I'm, I'm such a bad person. But. We, we can't look at it materially. We can't look at it from our perspective, like logical perspective, like why. It's kind of like we're saying, well. If someone did that to me, I wouldn't love them. Of course, Krishna's not like us, so we can't say that. But sometimes we think like that. With our logical mind, we're trying to think, why would Krishna love me? I've turned my back on him. Back on him for millions of lifetimes. And maybe it's not something we can perfectly understand. And maybe we don't have to understand much more than, than the fact that he loves us and he wants us back. And so we've been running away from him for a long time. And Prabhupada says he wants us back more than we want to go. And Prabhupada said, you may have heard, we take one step to him, he takes ten to us. Sometimes devotees say a hundred, I'm not sure if it's a hundred. Definitely at least ten. So, so and Prabhupada said, Krishna is more anxious for us to go back to Godhead than we are to go back to Godhead. And so we have to see, we, have, we want to see things through Krishna's perspective. And, and oftentimes we don't. We tend to see things through our perspective. That's normal, that's natural. But we need to see it through Krishna's perspective because that's reality. So. Sometimes devotees say, why would Krishna love me? Sometimes devotees even say, I don't think Krishna loves me. It's probably because they don't love themselves, so they think, well, I don't even love myself. Or, or maybe their mother was not affectionate to them, and they think, well, even my mother didn't like me, so why would God like me? But that's putting, a, you know, putting onto Krishna some material defect that a person in this world has. He's not like that. So, this is a beautiful thought because I may not want to do something, but if I know someone who loves me wants me to do it and is willing to help me do it and is pushing me to do it and is rooting for me to do it and is really behind me, it's easier to do. Isn't it? So, how strong is your desire to be Krishna conscious? How strong is your desire to go, to go back to Godhead? Not as strong as Krishna's desire for you. So on Jamastami, it's nice to meditate on, okay, Krishna's coming. Who's he coming for? He's coming for you. He's coming for me. Krishna's playing his flute. He's standing on your altar. Who's he playing the flute for? Not for Radharani. He's not calling her. She's next to him. He's playing the flute for us. He's calling us. Every time you see Krishna on the altar with the flute, think, or it's nice to think, he's calling me 
to his leelas. And what am I doing? I'm thinking about so many things that may not be related to his leelas. Right? I'm thinking, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to go here, I have to go there, I have to achieve this. And Krishna's saying, come play with me. This is all not that important. So that is a beautiful meditation. And he's come, he's playing on his flute, he's calling us. He wants us more than we want ourselves. We have a tendency to turn our back on Krishna. We have a tendency to face Maya. So many verses about this. That we 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 turn away from the person who loves us and we turn towards the person who doesn't love us, Maya, and we suffer. So When we look at Krishna's love, then we have to see that love in a way that is independent of any kind of love of this world, because it's not like love of this world. And if we see Krishna's love like we see the love of people in this world, it will have some restriction or some limitation. Right? Even, even the love for a mother, for her son or daughter, it has some limitation, it has some restriction. You know, there's, there's strings attached, there's demands. You know, I raised you and now I expect you'll do all these things for me. So, there's a lot of sacrifice by the mother, but there's still something is there, some payback, something they want to get from it. If not even just their own happiness. This love is different. And, and just meditating on the fact that Krishna is offering this love to us, how can you refuse it? And that's the sad thing, that we do refuse it, isn't it? That, and every time we chant offensively or every time we stay up late doing something that's not helpful for us, every time we disobey the order of Srila Prabhupada or do something that goes against what Krishna would want us to do, it's like we're turning our back on Krishna's offer, on his love. So these would be nice meditations for John Mastani, just meditating on, on all the ways, the manifestations of Krishna's love. You, you, you could say every verse is a manifestation of Krishna's love. Every Vaishnava is a manifestation of Krishna's love because every Vaishnava can help you. What to speak of Srila Prabhupada? He is the amazing manifestation of Krishna's love, the Bhagavatam, which embodies all Krishna's leelas. Maybe not all, but embodies Krishna's leela. That's a manifestation of love, the deities. So, I know it's hard to be Krishna conscious, and I know sometimes it can be discouraging. At the same time, if we look at all the ways Krishna is really calling us and supporting us and pushing us and lifting us, then we can appreciate, oh, he really has love for us. But there's, a, there's another thing also that's important. When we see the manifest, manifestation of, of Krishna's love, then during difficulties, we won't become distraught or we won't blame him or, or ask why Krishna is this happening to me. Rather, we'll think, this is a manifestation of Krishna's mercy and Krishna is doing this to help me. And it must be because he wants me to go back to Godhead. So therefore, whatever is happening must be a manifestation of his desire. Right? You agree? So understanding that Krishna wants us to go back, then everything that happens in this world, if we are sincere devotees, would be a manifestation of that desire. Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavatam he said that everything that Krishna has created in this world is meant for our liberation. This whole world is only meant for our liberation. Everything that happens, the good, the bad, is all meant for our liberation. That's the only purpose of it. It's not, you might say, well, isn't this world a place of punishment? It's not meant to be a place of punishment. It's meant to be a place of rectification. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to be punished to be rectified. It's not... It's not that you say this is a place of suffering, yes, but it's 
It's for our rectification, and that's how we become rectified. That's what we need. So Krishna does that, but Krishna does not enjoy doing it. Parents don't like to punish their children. But he does it, and therefore we are meant to see that everything that happens in our lives, the lives of other devotees, ultimately, it's meant it's a manifestation of Krishna's love and affection. And if you if you can see Krishna's love and affection in anything and everything, then comes to you, you'll you'll be fine. You may lose a friend, you may lose a relative. You may go through difficulties, phys- uh, health-wise, financial, whatever. And you see everything as Krishna's love pushing you closer to Him. You will, rather than suffer, you will take it as mercy. Oh, Krishna is helping me; He's showing me mercy. That's the idea. So this is a beautiful way to think. It's backed up by um, shlokas in the Bhagavatam. It's backed up by Prabhupada lectures that uh, a devotee never thinks he deserves better, a devotee thinks he deserves worse. Tate no kampam sushimikshamano. Devotee thinks, you know, I've done so many sinful things, and that even though there may be some suffering occasionally in this world, physically, mentally, circumstantially, because of all the sins that I've done, I actually deserve to suffer much more. That's how a devotee thinks. And then Krishna has minimized the suffering. So a devotee doesn't think, why me? But a devotee thinks that Krishna, his affection is so deep that whatever suffering is there, I deserve worse. But somehow or other, Krishna's helping me. And he's, he's, he's reduced that suffering. That's the idea. So, so we were saying... You can count all the ways that you can see Krishna's love, how it comes to you. We started out by saying, through the Leela it's coming, because the Leela is the main way he's trying to pull us out of this world. But if you look to see the manifestation of Krishna's love, you'll start seeing it everywhere. Of course, we say, oh, prasadam. But, but sometimes... Prabhupada would say, this world's a prison and we're prisoners, but look what's going on in the prison. There's so many varieties of food, so many varieties of flowers. There's so much comfort. There's so many things, and we're the prisoners. Look how Krishna's providing for the prisoners. What to speak of his pure devotees. So in this world, Krishna's loving everybody. He's supplying them so much. And they're turning their back on him. It's another manifestation of Krishna's love. Isn't it interesting? Yes? So if you open your eyes a little more with this idea, how can I find Krishna's love? Where can I see it? How is it manifesting? You will see it in so many places. When, when I think of the disciplic succession, I think, so many great devotees descended on this planet for us. Just amazing devotees. And why did they descend? Because for us to develop love for Krishna, we need the association of great acharyas, pure devotees. So especially at the time of Mahaprabhu and after, in order to bless us, so many great devotees came. And so when I think the Goswamis and then Lokanath, Narottam Das Thakur, you just go down the list. Bhaktivinoda, you know, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, Baba David, Yabhushan, you go down the modern times, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Srila Prabhupada. You just think, how much love must Krishna have for us to send these great acharyas? Isn't it? You agree? Have you ever thought like that before? And Mahaprabhu, so many associates, and they performed so many leelas. In those leelas, they did so many amazing things just to attract us. How much love does Mahaprabhu have that he just kind of bring 
his intimate associates in this world and say, okay, here, this is what we do in the spiritual world. And these associates, by their association, by hearing from them, you can become Krishna conscious. That's what he's doing. So I think that's one of the... Uh, a huge manifestation of his mercy, which then culminated in Prabhupada's coming here. Which probably was the greatest manifestation of Krishna's mercy since Lord Chaitanya, practically speaking. You agree? So, if you ever say Krishna doesn't love me, you have no evidence to prove that. But you have all the evidence to prove that it's true. And Krishna would not appreciate it if you say, Krishna doesn't love me or I don't know why he would love me. He doesn't appreciate it because he's showing his love. So to say Krishna doesn't love me after he showed you all that love, not good. Don't say that. Rather see that love. Appreciate it. Look for it. See it manifest. Mm. Another thing we could say about Jamastami, it's similar to what I was saying before. It's a day to become more attached to Krishna. It's a day of reflection. You can, you, can, you can have it as a day of reflection. Okay. Uh, what happened in the last year since last John Uh Am I doing better? Am I doing worse? What have I learned? What have I not learned? It's an it's a opportunity for reflection. How, how is my spiritual life doing? Another year has come and gone. How am I doing? If I'm not doing better, why? If I'm not doing better, what can I do? So, it's a, you know, these days are good days for reflection. And I think especially now with the lockdown, that most of us are going to have more time for reflection. Most of us are going to have more time for hearing, chanting. Because normally we're engaged in putting on these big Janmasthami festivals and they're not going to be so big and there's not going to be so much going on. Right? So it's a good time to appreciate, to look, to look. How, how am I becoming attached to Krishna? How, how did I do this year? Hmm. How to become attached to Krishna? How can I become more attached to Krishna? These kinds of meditations are, are beautiful. And what happens on Janmastami, or what happens on any holiday, is that there's special mercy. There's special mercy in the air. It's a very auspicious day. And therefore, whatever it is you contemplate, whatever it is you want to achieve, it's much easier on Janmastami. It's, like, it's kind of like being in the Dham when you're on Janmastami. You know how easy it is, or how easy it is to be Krishna conscious in the Dham? Well, Janmastami is like that. It's like, like the, the astrological influence that's over the Dham. And on Janmastami, Gorpranim, Prabhupada's appearance, and so forth. It's very similar. It's very, very transcendental. So, extra hearing, extra chanting, anything, extra absorption, anything you can do on Janmastami, it's going to be more powerful. So, I can stop for a while if anyone has any questions, because there may be, there may be other, other topics about Janmastami you want me to discuss, or you may have some questions about your spiritual life or philosophical questions. So why don't we just take a minute and see if anyone has any questions yet. Is someone going to moderate it? Or you want me to look, go to the chat and read them? Um, yeah, if whoever wants to uh, 
ask questions they can either type the questions and they can ask or they can unmute and ask the questions okay so koshika has a question koshik can you put your video on and i can see you when i answer the question i'll get more inspired i'm very sorry pro uh, my situation is such a way that i'm not able to access my camera oh I'm okay very sorry forgiven this time okay so koshik is asking when we are self evaluating how to evaluate humility <laughs> this is like a perennial question because if we think we are humble we're essentially proud well i i, I one thing we can definitely say that If I'm proud, I should be able to evaluate that, right? I should know that because that's a problem. And I, if I don't think I'm proud, I won't be able to work on it, right? So, definitely, that there's no question. It's not confusing. If I'm proud, I should be aware of it so I could work on it. But extending that argument, well, I should know. how much pride is a problem for me and i should know in general to what extent i'm proud and i should know what are the symptoms of overcoming pride and i should be able to evaluate if i'm overcoming pride otherwise how will i know if i'm doing the right thing so does that make sense koshik a little bit pro if you can give a little more clarification i'd really yeah. appreciate it I'll go on. There has to be we have to measure our spiritual advancement. So there has to be a measure of humility, right? And so let's say Koshik I say are you dealing with pride and you say you say yes I am, but I was much more proud when I was younger now that I'm older and out of university and working in the world. I'm not as proud as I used to be. I've been beaten down and so forth. And then I can say, "Oh, you're saying you're not as proud as you used to be. That's pride." You know, you could say that like a, an endless argument. <laughs> But what you're really saying is that from just an objective perspective, you can see that when you were 16, 18, you always wanted to be in the center, you always wanted to control you always wanted to show off and now you're not like that so just objectively you could say you know i'm not as i'm not as when i was 16 i was really proud so so many people say that don't they oh when i was a teenager i was so proud i was so puffed up when i was a new devotee i was so proud puffed up so it sounds like you're saying well i'm humble now and i wasn't humble then it's not exactly what you're saying but you're saying that by some objective criteria i can see that i am not proud like i was 10 years ago i'm not trying to attract people's attention like i used to be and if for example that were not true that you were still trying to attract people's attention by all the service you did Don't you think it would be good to know that, to be aware of that so you could work on it? Yeah, of course it would be. And so to be aware of that, we have to have some objectivity which in a sense transcends humility, just so that I know that I'm on the right track. Like I have to be objective. If we're having kirtan and I say koshik koshik Are you a good mridanga player? Can you play mridanga? And you are trying to be humble and you're the best mridanga player in Boston and you'll say Maharaj I can try, you know, whatever. Then I'm thinking, oh, I should get someone else to play because it doesn't sound like you're very good. So, to just tell me, yes, I can play. Are you good? Yes, I'm pretty good. You're trying to be humble, but I need a straight answer because I this is a practical question, right? This so then you're asking well won't that be won't it be pride won't that create pride and the answer is anything can create pride 
even things that shouldn't create pride can create it. Isn't it? You buy a new korta and you walk into the temple and you're thinking, oh, I'm better than everyone. I have a better korta. Any stupid thing can make us proud. And on the opposite end of that is you could have the greatest reputation in the world. You could have the largest amount of wealth in the world and you could be humble. It's possible. So it's not so much the situation, but it's the person. So if you maintain a humble attitude, then you can evaluate, Am I, is my pride declining? You could evaluate that in a humble way without becoming proud because I need to know that. I need to be able to conquer my pride and I need to know that I'm conquering it. So that's a, a more objective, practical answer to your question. If you want to take it to a little higher, or maybe not higher, but more philosophical, esoteric level, then you could say yes. If I think I'm becoming humble, I must be becoming proud. But I'm saying it's not necessarily true because there has to be some way to measure that because we need to become more humble. So how do I measure it? Oh. Today on the humble chart, I was at a two. That's very good. Yesterday I was at a four. I'm doing better today. Who's going to evaluate it? We have to evaluate ourselves. We have to know. You say something to someone, you have to know. Is what I said, was that a manifestation of my ego? Or did I say the right thing? You have to know, right? You have to know the problem so you can conquer it. Does that make sense, Koshik? Yes, bro. Thank you so much, bro. It gives me a lot more clarity. I'm proud to be humble. I'm proud to be humble. We're making a t-shirt that says that. I'm proud to be humble. You know, the world is full of con contradictions, but there, there was a lecture that I attended. Prabhupada said, you, he was talking about the qualities of a Vaishnava, and he said, you should see that these qualities are developing. And so what did he mean by that? He said, well, you should see that you're practicing, you know, you're advancing, and you're, you know, you're more controlled, you're kinder, you're, more, you're cleaner, you more tolerant and so forth. I said, you should see that things, these things are going on. So you could say the same thing. You could say, I feel like I'm more tolerant now than I was when I was a young devotee. And then someone says, Prabhu, you're proud. Because if you were humble, you wouldn't say that. But I don't think necessarily that has to be a sign of pride. It may be a sign that um, I'm working on myself and I'm keeping score. So I see how I'm doing. I need to know how I'm doing, right? So now we have another question. Looks like it's from a Spanish-speaking country. I was talking to a devotee today about considering yourself or not a devotee, considering whether or not you're a devotee. I mean... I always say that I'm trying to become a devotee. But if you have devotion for Krishna, you are already a devotee. Is it false humility to say that we are trying? One of the arguments is that every devotee is trying, but sometimes you say, I'm a devotee and you know that you're not doing the things right. You're doing what a devotee shouldn't do. So the question is, should I say to non-devotees that I'm a devotee or that I'm trying to know? It is a semantic thing, but anyway. Let's start with what you should say to yourself. What you should say to yourself is, I'm, I'm trying to be a devotee. For the non-devotees, you can say, by nature, we're all devotees. But that has to be uncovered. So now we're practicing to revive it. So we're practicing devotees. And so that's 
trying to become a devotee means I'm practicing. I'm, you practice something to try to become it. I'm trying to become a devotee, so I'm practicing it. That's, the, that's our humility. And even Prabhupada exhibited that humility. I'm not a devotee. All, all you, my disciples, you're better than I am. He exhibited that kind of humility. Hmm. But Gopinath should not be artificial. That's the worst thing. I'm walking around thinking, I'm not a devotee. Everyone's a devotee. And inside I think, you know, I'm probably the best devotee here. So, you know, it's better, you know, don't think anything in that area if you're going to think like that. Because that's worse. Prabhupada said we are not devotees, we're trying to be devotees. That meant Prabhupada was defining devotee as a pure devotee. And that's why he said we're not devotees, because he defined it as a pure devotee. So if we're defining devotee as one who is Krishna conscious 24-7, one who has prema, then yes, we're trying to be devotees. If we define it philosophically, Yes, philosophically speaking, everyone's a devotee, even the ones who are not practicing Krishna consciousness. They're also devotees. So it depends how you're looking at it. It depends how you want to use it. You know, constitutionally, we're all devotees of Krishna. But practically speaking, when you define what it means to be a pure devotee, then we say, I'm not a, I'm not a devotee. I'm practicing. I'm not a devotee. I'm practicing means I'm not pure. I haven't reached the goal yet. Right? That makes sense? And that is not only our humility, but it's also a fact. Sometimes we can get humility mixed up with the facts. Oh, Gopinath is so humble. No, Gopinath says, I'm not humble. I'm just telling you this is, what, this is who I am. I'm just being honest. Not, not artificial, honest. Gopinath might say, I am so proud. And then someone says, oh my God, you're so humble to say that you're so proud. But Gopinath actually means it. He said, no, I, I know I'm proud. I am proud. That's how I feel. That's how I act. I know that. So the, then the more you advance in Krishna consciousness, then the more you feel low. Okay. We have more. Um, Omkar Pradhan says, Thank you for the wonderful talk. How do we measure the quality of chanting over years? How do we understand that we are making progress in chanting? You like to chant? You find it difficult to stop chanting? You know you're not making progress when you don't want to chant. When it's hard to chant, when you, you put it off, do it later, I don't like it, get it done. That's all. Simple answer, right? Only took me 50 years to be able to answer that in three sentences. That's the value of age. You can, you can answer what seem to be difficult questions in a few sentences. Mm. You will understand you're making progress in chanting. You will understand you make progress in anything by your attraction for it, by your taste. By your detachment. Prabhupada also said, you'll understand by your detachment. You know, if I'm, if I'm too materially attached, I'm just accumulating so many things I don't need, I'm accumulating positions for no other reason than just having positions, I'm accumulate, accumulating more wealth than I need, I'm wasting my time, 
that's a sign that your chanting is bad. That you can measure the quality of your chanting by your material attachments. Not initially when you become a devotee, but after you've been a devotee a while, you can measure by your material attachments. You can measure by your happiness, your enthusiasm, your energy, all these things. If you if you are chanting properly, there'll be certain things that will just go that go along with it. And certain bad things don't go that will it will destroy. You know, it's like you're sick and you ask the doctor, Well, what are the symptoms of getting better? And he says, This, this and this. So what are the symptoms of becoming Krishna conscious? This, 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 this. If those symptoms aren't there, you have problems. That means either you're not executing the process properly or you're just not doing it enough. Oh, oh, Krishna. Do we have anything else? We have only two minutes left. Anyone wants to ask any question? Hare Krishna. So much can be said on John Mastami, but that's enough for today. Omkar, Omkar Prabhu has extended his question. He's okay. asking, some, sometimes I fear that after chanting for many years, I may not develop attraction for chanting. How do we chant, how do we chant with quality every day? Not, not when you me. chant, don't do anything else. This has to be off. Switch this off, switch your mind off, switch all the light switches in your life off and chant. That's very important. The problem with many of us is we have this on when we're chanting, we have this on when we're chanting, we have, we have our whole life going on while we're chanting. And you're not gonna chant good rounds like that. You have to, if you can just turn your life off, your quality of your rounds will go up at least 500% immediately. You don't have to do any, I could tell you 20 things you could do to improve your japa. In fact, we have a japa, japa affirmation book which you can download from Amazon. If you don't have it, it's definitely it's really helpful. I think it's only three or four dollars or something like that, five dollars for the hardbound and three or four for the digital. It's really, really helpful. But if you don't isolate yourself from the world and your mind and your phone while you're chanting, you can't really do those practices well. It's too much interference. It's like the radio, the TV, there's interference. So you have to be in an interference-free zone when you chant. And it's just amazing if you all try this, if somehow or other, if somehow or other you can just stop your life while you chant. You will notice, like, you'll say, I never chanted like this before, just doing that. And, and what a lot of you are doing is you're, you're chanting and you're trying to control your mind, but you're, your life is active. You know, it's like your wife's talking to you and you're thinking about what you have to do in your business. You come home and there's a project and you have to finish it at night, and she's telling you the kids this and the this and that. And your mind is just absorbed in what you're doing. It doesn't work. If you just stop thinking about your work, you can listen. As long as you're thinking, focus. 
right? So it's the same way. It's like you're talking to a person. Just stop everything else. Give that person attention. And then it's very easy to hear. But you're trying to give attention while you're alive, while you're still absorbed in your life, and you're constantly trying to pull your mind away from thinking about everything you have to do. And the reason you're thinking about everything you have to do is because you've given your mind permission to do that. You haven't told your mind we're chanting, so let's just chant. When I chant, I chant. That's your mantra. When I chant, I chant. For some people, when I chant, I Facebook. When I chant, I daydream. When I chant, I plan. When I chant, I think about my business. When I chant, I think about what I'll do in the day. No, when I chant, I chant. That's what you do. Simple, but it makes a huge difference. Is that okay? Good? Yes, Prajit. Yes, Prajit. TK? Yes. TK. Okay, so um, I can't stay for the kirtan. Can someone else do the kirtan? Okay, I said yeah. This this room is very hot, and it's uh, it's like it's, I'm sitting here sweating and falling asleep, <laughs> and I have somebody here. I didn't think I was going to do the kirtan. I have somebody here that needs to meet me. So if someone else can do the kirtan, that would be good. And then I can just leave and you can continue the program. Is that okay? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. So it's nice seeing all of you, or at least seeing your names. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of names. Okay. So somebody could sing. Mahatma uh, Prabhu, on behalf of ISKCON Boston, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to you for accepting this request and sparing some time, your busy time. I know that you have multiple requests from many, many places. Thank you for considering our request. You're and welcome. Your... My pleasure. Happy to be here. See all and of we'll, you. We'll request you again. Uh, okay. All the time. Sounds good. Hare Krishna. What are, the, what are the names of the deities? Radha who? Gopi Vallabha. Gopi Vallabha. Radha Gopi Vallabha. Ki Jai. Gopi Vallabha. Hare Hare Go. Okay. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Bhakti Namine Nama Thank you.